Welcome to Foundation and Podcast, the officially unofficial podcast for Foundation on Apple TV+. Plus. I'm Jim. I'm Aaron. And today we're talking Season 2, Episode 2, titled A Glimpse of Darkness. Uh, Aaron, what do you think of this episode? Um, it's another good episode of Foundation. Uh, there's a couple things I'm not clear on, uh, and I'm not sure if that's because, because they haven't fully fleshed out the, the rules, the things I'm not clear on. In particular... I'm still not sure where they're going with the the way that the Gale and uh, Salvor can psychically project themselves forward and backwards in time. And if, like, are they telling me that one has the power to do one, one has the power to do the other? They both can do that, and then they just haven't trained for it. But like, I'm I'm kind of still patchy on how that works. And uh, mm-hmm. um, but otherwise, and, and also I feel like um, I'm a little confused by the. Harry situation and his consciousness and how long he was imprisoned in the Raven uh, or uh, in, in the Prime Meridian no Prime Radiant <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the Prime Meridian he's stuck in Greenwich Mean Time just it's uh, the horror <laughs> the horror uh, but otherwise yeah like uh, the show is um, I'm really into the Cleon stuff uh, the Empire stuff I think the Dominion Empire Tense uh, standoff is fascinating, um, and the mystery about who hired the assassin I think is getting real that interesting. That was now. interesting because the way Empire was talking, the branches of Empire last week is that she had engineered that catastrophe to put herself on the throne. Doesn't that's the not the opinion I got from uh, uh, her this this episode. Um, a lot seeing... of just long looks in this episode that I'm like, how am I supposed to read that? Because there are several ways I could look into that. And it's fascinating the way that the foundation is consciously morphing itself into a religion and how that seems to like, even though they know they're doing it as kind of like a bit that uh-huh. they're also can't help but quite get lost in the bit a bit. And I think that's yeah, that's yeah. really interesting, and you know tracks along with the stuff that the they do at the foundation in the book. So uh, I'm I'm a pretty happy camper in this uh, episode. What about you? Yeah, absolutely. All all the things you said uh, apply to my watches as well. And man, I'm I'm really enjoying the first two episodes of this. I I look forward to seeing the next one. I haven't seen ahead of this one, mm-hmm. so yeah, I'm going to be able to do all the theory crafting and stuff that I like to do about this show. Um. So, yeah, well, we'll see. There's a lot of stuff that, even though I've read the first book, it's been a, a couple of years now, you know, since yeah. I, I read the first book about two months before the, the show came out. Uh, so I started to forget things, like this Hober Mallow that he's screaming at the end. Is this a character that was in number one, one of the one of the several dignitaries that Harden interacts with, or is this a character I don't know yet? Um, yeah. And I can't help you with that because I've read these books even longer ago than you have. I have oh, read them yeah, all a lot, um, and I could say some things, but probably nothing helpful. So <laughs> it's uh, well, I'm excited to to not know who frankly. is Hober Mallow is certainly a burning mm-hmm. question on everyone's mind at the end of this episode. It's burning. It's a burning question, literally on the <laughs> vault. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely on the warden's burning mind. <laughs> yeah, you uh, teach. Uh, uh, you give a warden a fish. He 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 eats for the night. He teach a warden a fish. He 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 eats the rest of his life, and he set and he set a warden on fire, and he'll be warm for the rest of his life. I think that's uh, uh-huh. Harry's that's philosophy. Totally. Uh, yeah. So I feel like we should just get right into it, unless you got other stuff to talk about. Nah, let's uh, let's get into it. All right, we start off on Sinex, where you know the hurricane was coming from from last episode. Pick up right there. Uh, Harry, before he's going to help them, has a bone to pick with Gale um, for leaving him stranded for so long. And they kind of talk about this. And then Salvor is like, hey, you have to get us off this planet. Otherwise, your second foundation is going to die on the vine. Um, so he fixes the engine, but there are some things he can't fix. The One of the stabilizers is stuck open and uh, Salvor has to go out and clear it before they take off. It's all barnacled up. Yeah, I kind of like that detail. All the the seaweed that's hanging off of it, the the barnacles uh, sucked onto the hole there. Yeah. Makes sense after 138 years. Honestly, I don't know if they put enough barnacles on this thing. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. And also, like, watching Salvor punch those barnacles off, like, ooh, boy. Ah, ooh. Yeah, her fist. 
Oh. Yeah, it's just, just going to be chunks of hamburger left after that. Because uh, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, fucked around with any piers in the water. Uh, those things are sharp as fuck, man. Mm-hmm. Hard. Hard, like, oh, yeah. like razor sharp clamshells. Uh, but, Harder uh, than knuckle skin. At least my knuckle skin. But did you, were you, because like I, I honestly can, could not tell you what Harry exactly is going on about at the beginning of this episode um, because he's screaming okay. about what did you think would happen when we severed my conscience from the raven did you think I'd sleep like you slept in cryo sleep and I'm like because I thought Gail said in the last episode that I put him in the 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 you know the prime radiant the night before while you slept and we even talked about this last yes. last week like is she referring poetically to the no. long sleep that <laughs> Salvor had done before she got there to wake her up is she referring to because like last night like I don't see if she transferred him last night I'm thinking that's a 24 hour period and then so are they implying that like a day some in time the prime radiant that's no. going so it's, it's going so fast that like he's been in there forever or no, I figured this out because it, I was definitely confused the way you were. And oh, I spent like God. 20 minutes going back and watching old parts of the episode and like looking at the details. And what he's talking about here is the time that he spent in the knife because she grabs the knife off the Raven as she's getting into her pod. And so he's conscious within the knife within the for knife. 138 years. Okay. And then she puts him into the prime radiant from the knife in that so he was already before. losing his mind when he got thrust into the prime yes and the prime radiant or, you know, spo- is the system that coached him through putting his mind back together a little bit or at least enough right I wonder if when we're seeing him screaming at himself in black and white if that's him in the knife and then when he wakes up into the giant conf- um, confusing 3D terrain that's when he's been uh, oh, it could be turned into the prime radiant. Why did she move him from the knife to the radiant in the first place? I don't know. Huh. Why not just leave him in the knife? She's worried the knife's running out of battery. <laughs> sure. Okay. I couldn't so tell he, you, but but that's the deal. So he did spend uh, a good long time, from a human perspective, trapped in some kind of machine mm. hell. I have no mouth, but I must scream type situation. Okay. Okay. Yeah alone with his own thoughts and then you know that's a dangerous thing like he said last season uh someone stuck in the vault for 50 years might go insane yeah well how about in a knife for 138 yeah it's uh it's a lot it's a lot um Mm -hmm. he also dropped this which i don't think that we knew that raish knew according to harry everything okay which yeah. is interesting because Raish is the one that kind of like I get it that the, uh, it's it seems like what the, the they're getting at is like no one accounted for Gail's psychic ability, mm-hmm. so you know she wasn't supposed to interfere with the uh, Harry Seldon murder. Um, certainly wasn't supposed to interrupt, and 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 Raish just had to improvise because yeah. like you know if you can blame anyone for fucking up the plan I guess you could blame Raish for taking yeah. the plan and saying nope forget it I want my uh, you know sweetheart to survive and that's that uh huh okay yeah he's definitely the most to blame uh, but you know understandably so um, I liked that the Harry has this kind of throwaway comment where he realizes that Salvor's talking about the version of him that's on Terminus and he I guess for our benefit says, oh, that's the other one. You don't know his mind. He doesn't know yours. Is that for our benefit or is that supposed to make us ask questions? Because for a moment, he thinks he is on Terminus. Is that just temporary insanity or is well, this like some one kind of those things where like the two? sometimes you see this like uh, they, they did this a bit with Invincible last season where they had this super villain that's a clone of themselves um and when they wake up they're convinced that they are the original sure because like from their perspective they, they are they have kinda. a continuity of consciousness I mean, and it's like yeah. you know and they like they get like really pissed off if you suggest that they're not i wonder if that's like mm-hmm. like he wakes up and he makes it but like but, but he's, he's he could have been the guy in terminus because i think it's the same consciousness but 
my suspect I mean I don't know they, they play this in science fiction a lot my sus- my suspicion is they're going to diverge pretty rapidly based on the experiences they're having especially one of them mm-hmm. staying conscious for 138 years losing a grip on reality and getting prime radianted yeah um, he's going to be a lot different than the character but it's also interesting that the vault opens up and fucking burns a dude just sets a motherfucker uh-huh. on fire like I don't know maybe that Harry's had some hard times inside there too it could be could be. Or maybe he's really not a fan of this magician shit. Uh, yeah, we'll find out. Probably, hopefully, next episode. Um, because that vault, you know, it's open, but it's uh, well, we might not. It, you might need to find Hober Mallow, and that's going to be a whole journey, I imagine. So, I don't think Harry's coming out until they get that Hober Mallow guy. I do think um, they, they this is kind of review, I, th- I believe, because didn't we have an inkling? I can't remember if this was something that was established last season, the, the, the second foundation's purpose. Uh, uh-huh. We know because they were heading to Star's End that they were going to, you know, that Harry's plan was to do a second foundation, but I'm not sure if he, like, illuminated what that, but now we kind of can talk, because that's one of the big twists of the foundation, that there is a super secret second foundation of psycho historians that in clandestine you got the primary foundations a lightning rod that's going to take all the attention and you know their successes and failures uh, they're uh, they're going to need to be managed empire is going to be managed you have to have someone that can account for the slight um uncertainties within the psycho history so his idea is a mm-hmm. second foundation that knows everything but also is hidden from human view so they can't interfere with the psychohistory predictions putting its thumb like he says on the scale yeah guiding them sort of down the right path uh which i i mean this to me this opens up the uh, sort of nesting doll uh, like foundations all the way down sort of concept yeah who who watches the watchers that kind of thing yeah um if if power has that potential to corrupt and they're worried about with that with the first foundation why would they not be worried about that with the second more powerful in the grand scheme of things foundation that's a great question secret third foundation is there a secret third fa- yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, or if the but second foundation I like if the first foundation is uh, yeah I can't I actually because like I keep forgetting that I've read this entire series and even me making jokes might <laughs> might, might oh, suddenly no. be influenced by the stuff I know about so never mind there's so two foundations, as far as we know, and uh, the second foundation was to, to keep the first foundation from getting too big for its britches and to account for other types of drift that we see. We see the bright red inflection points that are way off course. Since that never mm-hmm. happened, we're now at a crisis point where the whole plan seems like it's hinged to be dashed to pieces. Mm-hmm. Oh, one other thing, character point, like huh? Gale gives Salvor a big hearty hug at the end of the scene. Yes. Like their their relationship is beginning. to be alive it's not mother daughter but they're actually bonding uh-huh yep and we'll see more of that i presume uh so now we go over to savannah in the outer reach where a girl is out riding on a creature and she sees something and goes back and wakes up a drunk cleric and tells him i found a death threat in the form of a guy tied to a tree apparently he was killed by worshippers of the lightning god and he says well they'll be coming after us later so let's be prepared uh this is a fantastic location i'm always impressed when they like you know uh, uh, in season four of the expanse where they can find a place on earth that just looks like it's alien and this didn't look cg maybe hats off to the foundation Mm -hmm. team if it is but like they found the fucking alien landscape uh to put this cgi monster on do you remember what these things are called no these are the bishop's claw that threatened ah, yes. the early colonists of ter- colonists of terminus now they're writing them as beast of burden which mm-hmm. is a cool showing like how utterly masters of their environment that they've become um and uh yeah uh they, i like this I, I i instantly like these two characters me too um there, there, there's a kind of a funny subtle joke here where she's you know they're down at the lake or whatever drinking Mm -hmm. and she's scooping up water said let's bring some of this back for the cleric Mm -hmm. and then when she gets back she finds him passed out in a stupor and she dumps it on his head Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I don't think that's how she meant to bring it back for him, but or it was it pretty might funny. Have been. That'd be funny if that's like maybe, this kind of the routine. Um, but yeah, it seems like this is a, a common occurrence. That yeah. He's, yeah. Incapacitated. Yeah. And we'll come to appreciate in this episode um, that this is Polly from last season. Right. He, this is the 10 year old kid that was enamored of the uh, vault and you know they had that competition they tried to get clo- as close as they can and he succumbed to the null field Salver had to go rescue him um, and they posit that he is the last living survivor from Foundation the Foundation that remembers the last appearance of Harry Seldon mm-hmm. um, I thought that was, a, that, that was a really cool detail and they do some um, world building here they talk about how the Empire uprooted uh, from this planet and left these people with nothing and now you know they have this lightning god uh, they worship because you can see in some of the establishing shots of the planet just lightning storms constantly yeah. across the the surface of this planet yeah and it's, this is a uh, it's cool to see you know we've heard about empire receding and how they are withdrawing from the outer re- reaches of the galaxy but now we see it that like yeah the empire is just pulling up stakes and rolling back they're in full retreat I do wonder why, because the outer reach has been dark. It's not like the outer reach has been pressing in, taking these planets. The empire has just been pulling back, and I don't necessarily understand why the empire is intentionally shrinking itself. It takes, if it's a logistic problem, yeah, or think, if it, there's right some other there. threat. the The amount of logistics that's required to control area is direct is like probably inversely proportionate to the you know amount of area you're trying to control. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's like, it probably gets harder and harder. And so like, if you are, you know, feeling vulnerable, you're having attacks, people are trying to nibble away at your edges. The, it's probably better to pull back and consolidate rather than just, you know, uh, be stretched so thin that you can't respond to anything. But it's, it's, it's telling us that this is definitely an empire that's in decline, not just genetically, but in terms of resources, in terms of military might. And I guess you got to remember back to, you know, season one where there's a lot of people who don't like the rule of the empire. And it's not like there's some massive force that is threatening the empire. Um, It's just all these micro threats, right? These micro fissures in the empire are getting bigger because empire themselves are unable to get keep their shit tight, you know? Yeah, it's like a death from a thousand paper cuts type of deal. Mm hmm. Yeah, and pretty significant, too. Um, I was listening to the official podcast, and Goyer was talking about how it's gone from something like 10,000 planets to seven, six or 7,000, which oh, that's a is significant a significant... Decline. Yeah, that's something that everybody would notice. Yeah. It yeah. wouldn't be... It wouldn't really be rumors, almost. It would just be de, de facto, like, the Empire is in decline. But Look on the other it. hand, would the core of the Empire know... Like if they if, might not, especially because we know from the first season that the Empire controlled a hundred percent of the propaganda, like uh-huh. everything that went out in the news services was something the Empire directed controlled. So it could be that at the warm, glowing heart of the Empire, around Trantor and in the galactic center, that like yep, a lot of maybe people are ignorant of how far Empire has fallen. But clearly, it's not a sure. complete mystery because that Dominion's hitting them pretty hard with some facts. Yeah. Yeah, and she might be a lot more in the know than most people. Um, but yeah, the, this whole thing they're doing here with these magicians, I think, is kind of interesting. I, I like the way it's reshaping the foundation, but we'll get to a lot of that stuff later. Yeah. Uh, Trantor. Empire is admiring the paintings of the pre cleonic Empire. Uh, Dimmerzel tells him that Dawn and Dusk had no memories of hiring the assassins, but that's not necessarily a guarantee they didn't do it. She's going to continue looking into it. And she also suggests uh, someone who Empire pro- apparently hates, uh, Bel Rios, he uh, it, it, to, I guess, go after Foundation, to engage the Foundation. He reluctantly agrees um, and instructs her if he refuses this job, kill him. This is fascinating because you'll remember that Foundation was based on uh, Asimov reimagining the fall, rise and fall of the Roman Empire. That was kind of like uh, this, 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 this big uh, histography that that was popular at the time. 
And, you know, if you know anything about Roman history, it's replete with generals that have loyalty to their legions and politicians, you know, leaning on those figures. And it usually doesn't go Mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't always, you know, you got Cincinnati, uh, an example of uh, a guy who did the thing and then gave up all of his powers and relinquished control. But then you've also got guys like Julius Caesar cast and die and kicking an ass and disbanding senates and so it's like it's it's interesting to see you know we got a weakened politician here uh with a general that says you know like the, the elder dusk is saying oh he commands the loyalty of a lot of his fleets and you you just got to wonder is that you know like is is this is not a decision that empire likes is this something that he feels like he's being forced in and like what are the repercussions going to be as this mm-hmm. plays out yeah um i'm excited to see that that's one of the i guess uh paths of attack here on empire because there are so many that i this is, and specifically day um it, it's wild i guess how much he's changed and how much he's trying to change empire in his brief tenure but i guess that's his right as he- the active arm <laughs> Yeah, the as the what did these calls himself? The primary, I forget the. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't remember the, the term. They, they had a term of art for like you know which mm-hmm. the the main empire unit. Um, but I it, it, I like how they started where he's like looking at this painting from the like you said pre pre Cleonic dynasty and he's talking about how because in the first season empires are so grand and so untouchable mm. and, and so magnificent. And here he's talking about this pre cleonic dynasty that was 4,000 years ago and lasted for 2,000 years, which is more than his empire has lasted so mm-hmm. far and had four times the area and oversaw a blossoming of science and culture. And you can clearly see that he's thinking, I'm over a declining empire, which is not flourishing for shit. And what does that say about me? What does that say about us? You know, the mm-hmm. capital U. Uh, but also, he's super fucking arrogant and ego driven. And. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I'm still definitely unconvinced that this is a good idea. Um, I, I know your empire is crumbling and you're taking a big swing here, but is this the right swing to take? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not, but we'll see. The other thing I noticed in this scene is the very end of it after day has walked out of the room dimmerzel takes a long hard look at this empress and i read a lot of meaning into that i'm wondering if i i there's two ways you can go with this right if you go with the righteous uh just wants to protect the empire dimmerzel you could say she's worried about the return to this you know this pre cleonic empire Um, How can she avoid it? All that stuff. Or she could be looking at this thing saying, I see a lot in common with myself in this Empress. Boy, it would be cool to be Empress one day. Hmm. Think there's anything to that? I think, yes. I was more... um, Is this worry or ambition (laughs) in her eyes here? Or is it like an opportunity? It's just like you know, I've I've taken this Cleon thing because like we you know we've had this theory that like Dimmerzel is the true thing that maintains the empire, mm-hmm. but we also know Dimmerzel's been around a hell of a lot to- longer than even this Empress. Um, so the question is like, how long has she been enmeshed within the inner workings of the Galactic Empire? And is she thinking, yeah. is this a fork in the road? Where it's like, well, I've ridden this Cleon. <laughs> Uh, literally in the in the in <laughs> mm-hmm. recent times i've ridden this klingon horse as long as i can maybe it's time to do a different tack and i need to start supporting something different or is she thinking i've got to put a stop to this and i'm genuinely curious to see yeah. you know are we uh are, are we starting to see the ends of the klingonic dynasty and by the end of the season it's going to be done and we're going to have something else that's replaced it or chaos or um I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. But there's you're you're right. She is definitely thinking big thoughts at the end of the scene. Oh yeah. Um and there are a couple other times where she gives some ominous looks, but we'll talk about those. Uh so the Cleons discuss Bel Rios as they practice their intricate synchronization of eating. 
as if they were a single person. In prep for a meal with Day's wife to be, Queen Sarath. Uh, Day gets annoyed and then storms off. He hates this stuff. Um, it's funny because they they throw out this the this uh, Synthamorgan, which I thought was just some made up science fiction foundation term. Do you know that's a real li- that's a real uh, scientific not? term? No, what is it? A synthamorgan is a unit of measure for the frequency of genetic recombination. One synthamorgan is equal to a 1% chance that two markers on a chromosome will become separated from one another due to a recombination event during meiosis, which occurs during the formation of the egg and sperm cells. On average, one synthamorgan corresponds to roughly 100 million or 1 million base pairs in the human gemo- genome. So it's kind of like. Uh, a way that you could measure genetic drift or like how far apart uh, probability of genetic drift yeah maybe. that a chromosomes become separated and didn't recombine correctly um, and it might I'm not sure if this is being used correctly or if they've repurposed it 10,000 years into the future because it kind of the way they used it, it felt like Han talking about running the Kessel run Kessel. and so many uh-huh. parsecs and it's like is that a um but 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 again, I don't. But I just thought it was really cool that they're actually using a real term that measures some kind of genetic admiralities. And they're talking about he's off by three centimorgans. And apparently they've repaired that DNA. But mm-hmm. the effortless coordination that they used to have and the snapping of the napkins and the taking the drinks and like they're still doing it. But the effort it's requiring is so much more than it used to be. They got a whole body coach. That's like mm-hmm. looking and making sure they're doing everything the Cleon way, um, and you can tell this is really grinding days gears. Yeah, it's this and the needling uh, about the marriage and stuff yeah. <laughs> about him changing the empire, right? But but even at a base level, it used to be effortless. Like it didn't feel like uh-huh. I'm trying right. to pretend to be someone. I was that person, and you can tell that mm-hmm. like it is starting to get the day that like I'm putting forward this enormous amount of effort to pretend to be someone else that I'm not, and I just want I I want off. Yeah, that's the thing. It used to be all on day or all on dawn, rather. Um, the newbie, right? Like he's got to learn to be like us because we've already learned all this stuff. We already know we are that person. Uh, now it's kind of day is the real aberration here. Yeah, it, day feels like uniquely drifted from this, even though his DNA has been repaired. I was about mentally. To, I was about to drifted. say that because you notice that, like, when day storms off, like dawn and dusk are in perfect synchronization, just the way they drop their head and they put their hands in their and lap, fold their and, arms. Yep. Yeah, like he. Yeah, last year it was dawn. This year, this time it's day. This season, day uh-huh. is the is the weirdo. Um, yeah, uh, and that's. That's dangerous, because um, he has the power. You know, but what it's can one Dusk thing for Dawn do? to do that. Because they... we've seen Dusk huff and puff a lot, and they do have a uh-huh. certain amount of power. But like at the end of the day, we've never actually tested. You know, like Dimmerzel has been the one that's like solved uh, a big dispute between Day and Dusk. But like, yeah, what what powers mm-hmm. does Dusk and Dawn have to like gain say what Day wants to do? Especially if he officially, wants to... I don't think any. And, and like, especially if Day's doing something like, hey, I'm going to end the dynasty. This is it. This is it. Uh-huh. It's going to be me. I'm the last one. Uh, fuck you, da- Dusk. Especially fuck you, Dawn. <laughs> yeah, because Dusk, you've had all this power before. Right. You're all on you, your way out anyway. Dawn, you're on your to way the up. disintegration chamber, you know? Like, right, right. Yeah, Dawn's you're never going to get do... it. No, no. Which makes me think, you know, Dawn has the most incentive, I, I would think, to hire the assassins, but... There's no telling whether it's him, someone we've met, someone we haven't met. Yeah, uh, and they, still a they, lot of season to go. And so. we've never seen it. I, have we ever seen a highly competent Don? Because I think that's what we're getting this season. Like this guy seems like he's a student of history, and he's you know because he tries to flash out this like oh you know I was reading and I found out this other time where we had a charismatic uh, general and it caused problems for this and like Dave's just not having it, but. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought Don seemed pretty well read and thoughtful, and uh, yeah. And the, like I said, day's the problem. Bottom line, for sure. So we go back to Salvor, who asks Gail why she refused to start the second foundation, and she tells her all about Raish. Uh, then Harry comes in and tells them about the purpose of the second foundation, which is to keep the first foundation in line 
while guiding the galaxy to its dark age soft landing. Gail tells Harry about her visions, which she thinks are her future memories. They're 150 years in the future, and Harry thinks she should try and go into them to find a new path forward. Or I guess a path back onto the real path. Yeah, this is where, like, I just have to go with what the show is telling me because I don't exactly, uh-huh. you know, this is, I've never seen stuff like this in science fiction before. It's pretty, like, I I kind of think. It's definitely fantasy based. Yeah, I definitely kind of, it's not even fantasy because, like, in Star Trek, they have telepaths and, you know, people uh-huh. have some kind of clairvoyant powers. And it's always explained. It's not like magic. It's just something that we don't, you know, it's just something right. about subspace vibrations and and the fifth dimensional points of view that we just can't quite comprehend as, as humans yet. Uh, and I, that's one mm. of these situations where it's like, I think what they're going is that like Gale and Salver are going to realize that their powers are one and the same. And Gale is going to be able to project forward as uh, and backwards. And they're both going to be able to do this and, and, and develop this, this power. But um yeah, I I, I I don't want to say too much because, again, I have yeah. read the whole series and I don't have the particulars, but I do have the broad strokes. And I'm trying to squint and see how they're trying to smooth some of the transitions because, you know, Asimov wrote this all kind of serialized and he was, you know, making it up a lot as it goes. And it, it, it changes quite a bit from the beginning to the end. So um, it could be mm-hmm. that they're trying to, to, to smooth over some of the stuff. But. Yeah, apparently, um, I mean, some of the stuff makes sense, like, you know, Gail or uh, Salver can bring her back, and she knows this because Hugo used to be able to call to her and bring her out of her, you know, delving into her memories and her future past. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, uh, I'm just going, I'm just going, I'm just going with the show at this point. Yeah, conceptually, I'm much more interested in the second foundation and their purpose. Yeah. Um, and and how you know Harry has thought that that will go versus how it definitely could go. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It, it seems like a concept that is doomed to fail on the face of it. If if it, just applying the same logic to the second foundation as you would the first foundation says that the second foundation needs a third, and on and on and on. So you have to we'll, see the full we'll plan, and and we still don't. Um, but it's mm-hmm. like I remember like when I was reading this as a much younger man, like just how cool the the first book a book or two are where it's like there's so many plans and counter plans and yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I also really liked it's a fun part where, you know, Salver starts to object. It's like, you don't know the foundation. They're great people and they would never do turn into the empire. And he just looks and says everyone that you knew and the foundation is dead. Which yep. isn't actually sp- s- strictly true. We find out oh, with Polly. But, very close to. But true. is that yeah. so that's the thing? Is like sometimes the show. It's like the day. Is this like? Um, did Harry like misspeak, or is this, uh, or is this a deliberate thing that shows doing the show that like even Harry, his conscious doesn't know everything, and this is something that we yeah. should because like yeah he accomplished that everyone that you knew is dead. That's not strictly speaking true. Polly's still kicking uh-huh. so like if he's wrong about that thing that he surmises what other things can he be wrong about um, and especially because it's an assumption right yeah. based on reasonable probability Reason- I mean everyone should probably be dead in 138 years right yeah even but- with the modern medicine and whatever like that kind of gives us uh, you know an idea of the lifespans we're talking about today but but yeah yeah so if that's not a hundred percent reliable, how much of the path is a hundred percent reliable? Yeah, agreed. Who knows? Okay, then we go back to Empire, where the meal with Queen Sareth begins. She asks some very probing questions about cloning and the dynasty, and then she asks to actually see the clones. And day escorts her there. I'm gonna stop here for a second because there there's a lot going on in the scene. She's Boy, uh, I could not relate more with Rue, who says, you know, jokingly, but I think very pointedly, if she's not careful, she'll talk herself out of this marriage. Like, shut the hell up. What are you doing? You know, this is not how you behave in front of the person we're trying to impress here. Uh, And I'm actually still not certain why Day is not a little more dismayed by everything going on here. 
Is he just dumb? I know he wants this. I I know this is like his life's mission. But yeah, he seems a little or he, he seems, just needs you know this what it, he, seems, he seems arrogant. He seems like he in this scene, he's being offended left and right, but he never wants to admit that he's offended. He wants to act like he expects this, like he has you know uh, accounted for all of it and that nothing here is out of the ordinary and she can't possibly flap him. Yeah, he's trying to uh, go through the motions of being the old empire where like we were so grand and magnificent that we don't even notice the slings and arrows and the bites of the gnats. We don't even care. Like he's trying to, mm-hmm. you know, even though he's lost 20, 30, 40% of his territory and she's letting on that she knows more and more and more about and even saying she knows she's heard of the rumors of the genetic dynasty and mm-hmm. you know um, and the, the scene where she goes to the Principium with him is even more interesting that there's there's elements of her testing her boundaries here yeah with day there, there's elements of her testing her leverage seeing seeing just how much she has in this situation and day just handing her all of this information with his reactions. Yeah. It's a really well written scene. I, I love this. And stuff. her probing too, with like, oh, Dimmerzel, she's not dining with us. Uh, of course, uh, she must have, you know, she must have some uh, chamber of Dimmerzels too. Uh, else, how would you explain? And, and like, Cleon's, oh, yeah, she's got other arrangements. She's like, uh, she gives me the impression that she knows she's like a good lawyer. She's not going to ask a question she doesn't know the answer to already. So, like, yeah. when she's answering these questions, I think that Dominion is very well informed. And Mm -hmm. you got to understand it's like now to the point it's like, why is Dominion here? Why did Dominion accept this offer from the imp? Like, what is she? And if she's already this cheeky about like, you know, thumbing her nose at Empire, like when they actually start Uh negotiating a sharing of power, seems like she's in a position to wrest some real uh, concessions from him. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is her establishing the balance of power between them prior to agreeing to anything because she's pushing boundaries so far that I don't know that empire this empire is equipped to claw them back later and there's also a lot of things like you know we talked about the mystery of like who killed her family and she talks about they're talking about having children's like yeah I suppose and, and if that's a more sure line of succession than what he's got with the Prince and she's like suppose with enough children even an uplink crash wouldn't disrupt the line and then empire gets real quiet and she mentions yeah. that my sister was trained to be a stateswoman and a diplomat mm-hmm. and, you know, an economic. Ge- and my brother was a military genius who led our expeditionary fleets. And and I, you know, I was so unimportant. I was just allowed to be a Liberty gibbet. I was just a, you know, a dilettante. And it's interesting. So it's like. Does this make it like like where where are you at on whether on, on on whether she engineered this death in her family? Is she the dilettante? Is she the ingenue that organized and and is behind all of this, hmm. manipulated this, or is she saying to us as the that. audience that I shouldn't be the empress, I shouldn't be Dominion, but I am, and it's dangerous to underestimate me? Interesting, because this loss has I, made me cautious. <laughs> Uh huh. I hadn't considered that. Um, I think that's definitely a possibility. I, I, she seems, like you said, much more well informed and much more adept at this than just. I don't know. I mean, she's a socialite. She probably reads people well. She probably knows where she can, you know, push and where she can't. And. I think there's a lot of skill that comes with being who she has been yeah. that would transfer pretty well to this scenario. And she's fearless, and it works whether you believe that she killed her entire family to take power or that mm-hmm. she's had everything taken from her and she has nothing less to lose. She's either wildly ambitious or, um, you, you know, or or like single minded in like a re- some kind of revenge plot or some kind of like you know is she is she essentially. Uh, like Prince Oberon from Game of Thrones, where I, I'm just here to find out who murdered my sister and her kids and kill those, and then I can fuck off and go back to where. Or is she, yeah, maybe more like a Tywin, where it's like I actually killed all the kids, and I've, <laughs> I I want to make sure I'm the one on the throne. Like I, um, 
Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly interesting. I think the other thing that's happening here um, is, you know, Cleon has just said, well, we can assure, we, we can have a certain amount of assurity by just having a lot of children. And then she points out that she was one of three children. Now she's one of one children. That's not nearly as stable as you might think it is, you know, just having a bunch of children. But in the same breath, she's also describing the Cleonic dynasty, I think. There are three of them. Yeah. Uh, it, and granted, they have clone backups, but right. they're, they're, what she's saying is there is no real amount of sh- assurity mm. that you can have. You shouldn't be so secure in the idea that you can just be cloning yourself because, I mean, you take a bomb to that Principian, you take a bomb to the three brothers, and that's it. I like how she you know? also the the phrase assassination by procreation. Uh huh. You know, like uh, like she's going to like this marriage can do what so many people have, that uh, have tried and could not, which is destroy the Cleonic dynasty. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Like as sure and as specifically a bomb to Dawn, the Prince of Praetorium is would it, we, you know we talked a little bit about Dawn and specifically Dawn, and I can't help but notice in this scene she's really leaning into Dawn. She's you know put, putting her hand on his arm she is paying a lot of close attention to dawn and i don't know if that is her trying to figure out you know the assassination attempt was it dawn can i can i glean something here in this meal or or she just trying if to she maybe off. doesn't have aspirations to be with day but she wants dawn and they can together interesting rule because that would be a much longer rule i i don't know yeah, I I got it uh, when I when I was watching this. I I got from that that she was noticing, you know, because she's she is she's like she's saying like, hey, well, how do you guys? How, you're you're the branches being lopped off that we're speaking of. How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? And with Dawn, maybe seeing, because I think they're closer to like their age. Yeah, like just you know, like you know, sure. like uh, it seems like she's half Lee Lee Pace's age, um, and she's a third child, so probably younger. Yeah. There's a lot like of of and in, in, in common. We've all when you, you know historically mm-hmm. when we look at the first season, Dawn's always the weak point. It seems like that's a common vector of attack. So makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then let's go down into the Principian here because this gets way more interesting. Uh, Dawn shows Sarath Cleon the first and his own backup clones, and explains how the whole process works. She tries to confirm that the rumors about the clone corruption are true, but Day doesn't exactly confirm it he doesn't say anything although the look on his face says shit she knows too much yeah uh, here's the other affront the, the one that she points out to him is an affront she quotes this poem at him that has been banned across the empire and is a crime to recite from and she recites it to his face and points out that I just committed a crime in front of you. And what's funny and is what? and and he doesn't even know. Like this is a law that he himself passed a generation uh-huh. or two ago and he has no idea, which kind of gives you an idea of like how and they did this really rapid fire crackly dialogue where yep. you know, she says uh um you know, like she asks, uh, like, uh, wh- will these assassins like they, they tell me about this attack? And he's like, yeah, we, we put him down and there was a ruthless display of justice. She goes, do you think the assassins will be deterred? And she goes, we at Dominion, we don't try to deter. We ask why there's unrest and then attack the root causes. And he goes, mm-hmm. well, your hand is a lot lighter in Dominion than we have in the Empire. She's like, well, a well-trimmed vessel requires a light hand. And he's like, Dominion is small. Empire Scale, shrinking. Yeah. They just go back and forth like that. Uh-huh. And uh, she it ends up almost getting him to spill the beans about the genetic drift, and she goes, "Well, mm-hmm. that would explain." Oh, is Empire strong? Yeah, that would explain your interest yeah. in my unex- unexploited womb. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. It's yeah. It's no. It's a. It's a great. It's a great scene. Absolutely. Yeah. The the dialogue is great. Um, the setting is great. I really love going down into these clone chambers. And she's this very teasing because she's like, are you expecting us to have intercourse? And he's like, oh, well, you know, we've got the genetic scientist. And I forgot the empire is sterile genetically that they can't yeah. have children. So there's a way that they can reverse that. And they've already tested the genetics and they're very compatible. And mm. yeah, they were testing the genetics in real time here. He got her DNA off the glass she was drinking. From. Yeah. 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 It's cool. Uh, yeah. So let's move on to the next scene. We've talked a lot about this one where uh, 
Brother Constant is this girl's name who was writing this creature mm-hmm. earlier on. Um, Brother Constant walks into a town on Savannah to put on a show and preach to them. Some of the locals start hassling her, telling her to leave, uh, take her foundation propaganda elsewhere, and they chase her, try to attack her, but then the high cleric shows up and dazzles them with a light and magic show while preaching the good news of Harry Selden. Um, and they're, they're, they get an alert and they're called away. I really liked uh, when she looks up at the cloud. You might have missed it, but like there's a cloak ship. Like you just see the vague outline of a ship in this cloud. And she's like, mm. you know, uh, clearly they have a routine worked out where she works the crowd, gets them all worked up. And then he comes in with a razzle dazzle uh, light and technic show. Um, yeah. Th- I mean, these are people who believe in lightning gods. Sure. And so they kind of give them that flavor right they pretend to be gods he comes down in this shaft of light from an unknown source he's shooting off fireworks and creating crazy images essentially stuff that's magic and yet what he's preaching here is science and i think that's that's really interesting yeah and there's they're showing some cracks like you know they're suggesting that like the foundation has been able to be very successful spreading with this kind of religious like the instead of like trying to the wean people off of their superstitions is lean into it, you know, do like a Roman thing where uh-huh. it's like, oh, your God does this. Oh, actually, let's help you to understand that your God is actually our God. You know, yeah, we got one of those you, too. <laughs> yeah, you, your three gods are our God just in a trench coat, you know, and a, and a pair uh-huh. of uh, fake nose and glasses. Um, but like, it seems like the locals are starting to wise up. Like, they're not as intimidated by this magician. Like, they're like, you know, they're cowed briefly when she has the shield, but then they try to gang. They're like, well, we know how to d- disrupt this. And they just gang up on her and is, is a, a wear the shield down. And she drops one of her trinkets. And they very conspicuously mm-hmm. show an old man from the village look at it thoughtfully. And I wonder if they're suggesting that the, the foundation is maintaining their you know kind of sway over these places by by solving their problems but keeping them proprietary and mm, now yeah. like maybe this magical technology that gives them this power is going to be owned by the masses and now what you know what do you do yeah. I, I don't know if that's what they're going for but that's what i was thinking when they showed her drop that bracelet and the old man pick it up yeah makes a lot of sense um it's uh, all, that it, crowd man they're fickle too like yeah. <laughs> that you get them chanting one moment cheering the next yeah so. But I mean, it's also like that would be a hell of a performance if you saw as an agrarian society, mm-hmm. some man descend from a shaft of light and shoot fire out of a sentence and summon the galactic spirit and say he can cure your crops dying and uh, he can drive pests from the village. It's uh, and and then, uh, yeah, and you talk shit to yeah. him, he picks you up and throws you into a water tank. So. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's also wild to know that this is the foundation. This is the thing that Harry Selden founded of, of reason and intellect, and they're mm-hmm. charlatans. And, and it's it's Flim crazy because you know we're we haven't seen we haven't seen foundation in 138 years. This mm-hmm. is our first glimpse of it in that period, and you start to wonder like what has foundation become. If this is the forward-facing foundation, what is it? And, and 138 years is a long time for something to change. An Four organization or five generations, like yeah. Yeah, there could be a lot of drift. Uh, and I think they do that very smartly. And I think later in the episode when we see that this is essentially just recruitment, mm-hmm. it it starts to make it, it, it layers on it. You know, I talked about Terminus um, and Empire and everything being kind of characters in their own right and that to me is part of you know what makes that an interesting layered character is the different things we find out about them yeah um so let's i i guess go to the next part of the scene the vault has apparently opened and they've been called back to terminus the second coming of selden means the second crisis which worries this high cleric and they head back uh but he's also you know, his faith has wavered a bit <laughs> and I can't really say I blame him. He saw Harry as a kid and that was amazing. And that carried him through the first hundred years of faith. <laughs> but you get past the centennial mark and you start to think, is this guy ever coming back? I thought he was here to guide us. I thought he was going to help us. Yeah. And the fact that like, you know, when he comes, he he's kind of a prophet of doom. It's like it's it's one of those scary, exciting things like, oh, my God, this is happening. But also, oh, my God, this is happening. Yeah. 
And we also see how they've solved the lack of spacers. They just punch in an autopilot course and slap some patches and go to sleep. And I thought, you know, because I, every time I finish one of these episodes, watching two or three, you know, I've, I've watched up to four, uh, I put a list of like all the open questions and I'm like, you know, uh, your whole crew passes out during your jump trip. That seems very exploitable. Mm-hmm. If you are a military force that has spacers that can stay awake during hyperspace jumps, that seems seems crazy exploitable. But uh, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see if that any of that comes to pass. Uh, yeah, definitely. But I thought it was like super interesting, the technology, because this is all Invictus based, right? Mm-hmm. It's just that they've found a way to nullify the deleterious effects, I guess. Yeah, you don't of, need of an active navigator anymore. They've got some kind of computational yeah. base, and then so they just all... They, they haven't mastered the art of, oh, hyperspace travel fucks you up physiologically, and they just sure. they sleep through, it's just they don't need to have anybody awake. Uh-huh. Not even the Empire has that technology, because they rely on the spacers, the, the specially genetically engineered humans that withstand the stresses of interdimensional travel. So they're yeah. actually more advanced than the Empire at this point. Yeah, in some ways. It'll be interesting to see if they develop travel uh, faster than light travel that they don't have to go to sleep for eventually. Because mm, that would be probably that would be better. truly yeah. advantageous. Anyway, Salvor decides that Gail needs to try listening for her voice in her memory so she won't get lost in it. And she tries to enter her, her future memories here, but it's not working. So she decides to kill herself. Literally. <laughs> she removes all the air from this compartment and passes out. And then she ends up in her memory. Is chased by someone she's going to refer to here in a bit as the mule. He grabs her and demands to know where the second foundation is. And then she hears Salvor's voice and returns to the present to tell them what she experienced. The mule's afraid of the second foundation. Um, and she's got this location of where she knows the second foundation is from the memory. It's a place called Ignis. And they look that up. Yeah, I uh, I thought it was kind of cool that like in in the um, oh shoot, what's their planet the name? Uh, Synex. Synex, yeah. That the word prophecy is like means water takes them. So they've got this kind of like drowning uh, going into this altered state so they can do these prophetic trances and she uses the fire suppression system to do that um, we get hit fast and furious with a bunch of words we've probably never heard of uh, this 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 mule guy picks her up and wants to know where her mentalics are uh huh and uh, wants to says, can, see, can, can look into <laughs> her mind and see that there's a younger version riding a shotgun within her mind which is kind of wild and ask if he's she's from the age of empire which implies that we're post imperial in this timeline mm-hmm. um, shouts out Hober Mallow who boy he's he's the he's he's the most wanted they're the most wanted person in the galaxy either in the future in the present the vault's asking about him. The mule's asking about him. What the hell? Uh-huh. And the, the other was... thing, the thing that I thought was wa- the wildest is that there's a, a hand mark. Yes. I I don't know if this is the foundation uh, people uh, just kind of like playing fast and loose with like metaphor because like I... I, I can't figure out how that could possibly have worked. It's like in the Matrix, like your your body, make your brain makes it real. Like, how how do you sure form bruises and yeah? How do you put thumbprints? Was, was she grabbing wind? her neck as she was in this oh, memory and squeezing? Maybe, I, maybe. But, but it surprises Salvor. It does surprise like, Salvor. Your neck. Yeah, but it could it could so, work if she grabbed her own neck. You could like I could like if you grabbed your neck so hard it left bruises, I might still be like, God damn, Jim, your neck, <laughs> your neck. Yeah. yeah, what are you doing? Uh, maybe, maybe, but I don't know. Barring that, it does seem like there is some physical connection to the memory she's in, which is wild. Here's a connection that works. I came up with. I couldn't help but notice Brother Constance has these most arresting blue eyes. They're supernaturally blue. When the mule took his goggles off, I couldn't help but notice he had very similar glowing White mm-hmm. Walker eyes. Yeah, very blue eyes. You saying Brother Constant becomes But but didn't didn't the mule. didn't uh, 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 um, Hugo 
Wasn't that like a he did. that 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 was one of the Anacreons or um the the no this is the Thespians were were the ones that had the blue eyes. <laughs> Thespians, yeah. The Thespians, not Thespians. <laughs> The, the actors the thespians that uh, mm-hmm. so I, I so i'm not sure I, I i see there's a connection here but i'm not sure exactly what they're trying to say are they trying yeah, to say we just this is a, don't have enough information yet yeah like are they like um yeah like what are they trying to say here is they're hinting at something yeah yeah i wonder like i legitimately don't know haven't read that far ahead so um was it not a theory that we had that maybe Hugo, uh, that maybe Salvor is pregnant with Hugo's child? Because that would be an interesting it's connection possible. if, like, Brother Constance is a descendant of Salvor and Hugo, the same way that Salvor is descendant of Raish and Gale, and then the mule would also be related. And the fact that he's got mm. some kind of mental powers. I wonder if they're trying to imply Slowly. there is some kind of actual relation mm-hmm. or maybe it's the there, eyes there might be. Might be. maybe the psychic that that's some kind of um signal that they have psychic powers it's the longest gestation period ever 138 no, I'm years not saying she's, i'm months. saying that she might be the grandchild of like you know like the descendants of salvor and hugo oh, all no no, no i mean it like if salvor is pregnant that's the longest gestation she, ever she's right been in the like, cryo chamber uh huh. Oh, okay. I know. But 140 <laughs> right. years later, yeah, yeah, yeah. a child is born to yeah. uh, of Hugo's. Like, how do you track that in the family tree? That's, right? like, that's like what 2000 like, trimesters. What's this 140 year gap? <laughs> that's uh, a lot, right? Yeah, I carried you in my <laughs> for 140. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I looked. Is up... Gail gonna drown in every episode? Because this is number two, <laughs> and she's drowned right, twice. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe that would be uh, kind of funny i so ignis the star system or as planet uh literally means fire in latin mm. relates to fiery things i wonder if that's going to um you know when we get there a if lot of fire gonna, in her visions it's gonna it's, that's gonna be important yeah could be super interested to know more about mentalics and hover mallow but and, and both salvor not ready for that and gale get this kind of sight when they see this planet they they feel called to it there's something that's like they, they mm-hmm. it's vibrating that they feel like this is the right path i wonder if that's i i wonder if that is something they can trust you know yeah we'll see uh it's also conspicuous that like there's a delay in gale detecting it whereas salvor feels it right away it has to say you, you feel that you hear that right and she says no and well yeah. listen yeah i wonder if you yeah if you think about the way the future versus the past works if there's something to that i feel like i said i feel like there's a whole lot they're telling us in these scenes that is going to be clear maybe later on yeah i think you're right uh so then brother constant uh reunites with a friend who is worried about war they're on uh, terminus and the high cleric goes to a planning meeting for greeting Harry from the vault and there's a lot of contention on who should greet him Uh, we also find out that the director is Brother Constance's father uh, sets up some tension there yeah so like does she have two dads because when she she greets this one man right off the shuttle and calls him Pater which is, I think, uh, whatever language they're speaking for father. But oh, then, really? I assumed it was just his name. Oh, maybe it is. Uh, I Peter, thought it was some kind of version it? of like Padre or fa- or Pate. Like, cause I, mm. I think there is one language that Pater is father. Um, maybe. I don't know. They they struck me more as like lovers or very close friends something like that see i thought they were suggesting that maybe she could have two fathers and they have some maybe. other way to re- but anyway uh i i thought it, and, and, and that guy's clear as i mean, maybe she's a, he's a, her uncle or something but yeah clearly mm-hmm. you know the, the the mayor is also or the director is also her her father or is her father for sure yeah yeah she's calling him father specifically uh, I thought it was interesting to see the state of the foundation, you know? This is the second glimpse we get of it, and it shows us that, oh, it's not just 
a religious organization that goes out and evangelizes. There's a whole military wing of it. There's yep. whole. I guess we saw that briefly in the last uh, episode. We saw that there was a warden. Um, but they've got this religious angle, which is for recruitment. Um, we know they've been told by Harry they're going to go to war with the Empire. I, I honestly am not sure about the High Cleric's critiques here. I think he feels marginalized and feels like they've abandoned Harry's mission. But Harry specifically came out of the vault and said, we're going to war with the Empire. Get ready. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be what the director has done. I mean, Spoiler preparing yourself militarily. Now. Yeah, that's what you should be doing in the 138 years. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's some... So pop- what is his objection to military base, like setting up military bases on other planets? That seems right on. Are we talking about Polly? Uh huh. Because Polly seems like that's what I'm saying. I was going to talk about like the fact that there's political factions, like that you know yeah. everyone's kind of singing from the same hymnal when it comes to like outward facing things, but internal. Like Polly was not a fan of turning everything into religion, and he thinks that this is a perversion. Uh-huh. But he also, in the same breath, will say, "I'm the high cleric, and I should be the right. one talking to the pro-. like." You can see that like these these like you know. Um, uh, and sometimes we're taught as children like the words don't mean anything sticks and stones break our bones blah 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 but like words actually do have a lot of power and it does shape the way we think about things and mm-hmm. I think they're trying to tell the story of like the foundation saying oh ho ho we're gonna do this magic and this religion as a way to like you know appeal to the masses but that decision over the course of few generations is drifting dangerously to where they're believing it like yeah why wouldn't they yeah I mean, and especially yeah, now I, I, that there, I, I, there's the poly, the head one is like kind of in on the joke. But if he die, if he if he has an overdose tomorrow, with every shooting up or you know drinking, like that's the last. He might be the the, the only thing keeping uh, the foundation even kind of sort of secular. I get super strong Scientology vibes from all this. Like there's the religious like Xenu Thetan bullshit angle, right? Uh, and then behind that mask there's people who want to make a lot of money and take advantage of their power. Yeah. And that's I like, what it feels like. I like that when he, they talk about the prophet and, and Polly says, which way oh, are you spelling that? Line. You know? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's, it's a great, it's a great fucking line. Uh-huh. 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 And, and Polly's disappointment of being sidelined. Like we're using you for your political power, but we're cutting you out of the. You're the only person that's that that saw and talked to Selden or Harry last time. But fuck you, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 then that also like the fact that this marshal or warden guy doesn't even do the thing he said he's going to do. Like you know, uh, doesn't uh, even inter- did son of a bitch didn't even introduce me. Um, I thought nope. that was interesting. The 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 fact the foundation is as we saw in the first season, somewhat divided about which way it should go. Yeah, and there's a lot of, um, you know, with that profit line, there's a lot of insinuation about personal gain versus, uh, you know, just supporting the foundation itself. Yeah. And I, I, I don't feel like we've gotten a great taste of that yet. I don't see the director as necessarily being out for his own gain. Uh, I, yeah, maybe this office looks like Terminus a little bit, or it looks like Trantor a little bit, but also look, you need a place to meet. You need this kind of stuff. I don't know what the other people's houses look like, you know? Maybe it's all paved in gold. Mm. Uh, So I'm looking forward to seeing more of that, I guess. Sure. The the personal versus, uh, you know, for the foundation kind of thing. Anyway, everybody goes out to the vault, and the warden gives a speech about how awesome it is that he gets to be the one to greet Harry, and then his body is lifted into the air and charred to a cinder as he shouts, Hober Mallow, bring me, get Hober Mallow. Uh, and nobody has any idea who he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I like how like everybody's like, who? Because I was like, yeah, who is this Hober Mallow? And, and the show wants us to be thinking about it. But it's so funny the way Polly is so petty about this because he's like when, you know, this guy says, I will lead you whither the prophet leads us. And he's like this fucking showed saying whither he didn't even introduce me. <laughs> and then he gets lifted in the air and everybody thinks this yeah. is like you can see the warden starting to believe like, oh, I yeah, I've been ex- I've been chosen by the prophet. And then he fucking burst into flames in the most painful way possible. I don't know why. <sighs> 
I don't know, because I, I like I, I kind of like when I was watching it. I don't know something about this warden made me think that he's just a just this massive dick. There's I have no uh, reason to believe that, you know, <laughs> this drunken yeah. old man has convinced me with like three words that this guy is evil to the fact that I'm like, yeah, burn, motherfucker. He did. I don't know if he did anything wrong, but uh, mm-hmm. that's the other thing It's like, yeah, what the hell is, uh, uh, is Harry doing in there? Why is he burning random people? Uh, this is I don't know man like if you want to talk to this Hober guy just come out and be like uh, yeah I want to talk to this Hober guy uh, I'll wait and while you're finding him why does he got to fucking burn this dude alive mm-hmm. and I, clearly um, the warden's experiencing some kind of visions during this you know he's I don't think he knows Hober Mallow either no. so Harry's doing something to this guy beyond just burning him alive he's using him as a mouthpiece yeah yeah, it'll be, um, but yeah, but also, you know, Harry might be thinking, well, if they're expecting a vengeful God, then I'll give him a fucking vengeful God. Yeah, maybe he is trying to establish himself more as a God. Maybe the second, because fa- that's the question is like, maybe the second foundation is around the, the, maybe they're behind the religious curve. Like Harry's like, you guys are still mm-hmm. pretending you should be true believers by now, but that's a yeah. widely different Harry than the one that wanted to kill himself before he got too big of a religious following. But it's all it's all timing and nudging and tweaking when it comes to psycho history, isn't it? Let me ask you this. Is it possible that the second foundation Harry is worried about the first foundation Harry being the guy who the power is going to go to his head? Could this be a flash of that? Are you, not not the people in the foundation, but Harry himself at that foundation. If you're suggesting that there is like a struggle for Harry supremacy, Selden supremacy, <laughs> I don't know, uh-huh. but that's a fucking great concept. If the two yeah. artificial copies of Harry Selden start coming up with a doctrinal war, I would uh-huh. I I would fucking love that. That would be pretty cool to explore. I agree. Uh, the other thing I like about this is. You see the Black Vault turn into this kind of uh, scaffolding, this golden scaffolding. Yeah, the crystal. Uh, a golden framework mm-hmm. that we saw last season. Mm-hmm. And if you notice, the pendants around the cleric's necks are all the shape of that, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, the the, the shape of the open vault, not the closed vault. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in the final scene here, we see Salvor wake to find Gale worrying that they're making a huge mistake. And she says... That's because I saw your dead body in my vision. And then we've got to wonder, you know, is this a vision that can be avoided? Is this a certain vision of the future? Can they be on a different path and still be on a good path? Uh, Who knows? You know, we joked in the preview coverage about like, how are they going to keep? Because it's, you know, you could keep Klingon around. You know, we we talked about last season, like, you know, by third season, fourth season, uh, uh, or is Lee Pace going to have like a Quasimodo hunchback and three eyes Mm -hmm. and two toes, you know, (laughs) six toes on each foot? Like what's going to look? But like. We're like, well, what, what are they going to do with Gale and Salvor? Are they just going to, like, jump in a cryopod at the end of each season? But, like, the, I think this episode itself raised that possibility. Because Gale's like, how am I going to project myself 100 years into the future? I'll be dead. And he's like, well, you slept through one century. What? <laughs> I'm like, holy yeah. shit. And then Gale and then Salvor's there, too. They're 100% going to get into a cryopod. Because yeah. they don't even, uh, well... I guess Gale, it could be some kind of residual self-image bullshit. But Salvor's yeah, laying but there on the Salvor. ground does not look appreciably older. Like, maybe she's five, Agreed. ten years older, but she doesn't look like she's in even middle-aged. So, mm-hmm. it's going to be a plot point that these guys are going to jump into a, another cryo chamber. Yep. I love it. End of every season, get them in the cryopod. Gale drowns every episode. Yep. Yeah, Harry gets uh, a little bit crazier because he has to spend the nut. He's uh-huh. like, no, don't put that. And then he goes through another hundred years of uh, uh, not deathless sleep. And and Lee Pace puts on 30 pounds of fat every at the end of every season. <laughs> I want to see sloth Lee Pace. I want to yeah. see that guy. You know, Fat Thor. Uh, yeah, depressed. Levels of Lee just, Pace. Just drinking Paps Blue Ribbon uh-huh. on the throne. Day and dusk <laughs> both aghast. Uh, yeah, show me that Lee Pace. I like. I know he can work out a lot. I've seen him do it. Can he pack on the pounds yeah. in another way though? Yeah, you can sculpt that body. Can you deface it, Lee? That's what we want. Right. Know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, you know, I bet they're thinking that too. I bet they're going to have a lot of fun with the, with the various versions of uh, Brother Day. Yeah, I am curious because, like, uh, I wonder when the next uh, Flash Forward will be. Because we went through a couple of dynasties last year too. Yeah. So it could be uh-huh. that we go through a few this one too. Uh, yeah, I'm. I can't. I'm looking forward to seeing where this mystery uh, leads. Lots of uh, names. This Hober guy. We got the Rios guy. There's going to be a lot of people we're going to be meeting in the next few weeks. Are going to be important, and I, I can't wait. I just want to say there's also a pretty good chance that Lee Pace will be down for that. Did you know? I, I was listening to the official cast, and David Goyer was saying that they wrote the scene at the beginning of of episode one, the the fight scene with the assassins where Lee Pace was in a robe the entire time. And Lee came up to him and said, do you mind if I do this scene naked? <laughs> I think, it would, be, I think no, it would be no, better. No. And, and, yeah, and David <laughs> said, uh, I was hoping you would say that because I was secretly thinking it. Got to putty up your belly button, but sure. No, I, it's, right, yeah. Right. yeah it's, so I could, man, Lee Pace will be down for it, whatever they do with him. That'll be cool. Do you mind if I just do this naked? Can I just do all the scenes naked? They probably just kind of work better. Yeah. Yeah, the fourth time he asked that about a scene, David was like, no, we really need you to wear clothes this scene. Yeah. Yeah, Wait, it's important. We're running out of putty. Uh, we're running out of putty in the bu- the belly button budget. <laughs> yeah. The all-important triple B uh, b- mm-hmm. below the line item. You got to watch those. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about? Get, uh, get hyped for so. episode three. Uh, what do you have to say? We would like to know. Send that feedback into foundation at baldmove.com. Once again, that's foundation at baldmove.com. That's how you get all your feedback in to us for consideration. Uh, we can be followed at damn near every social media at bald move. TikTok is a stubborn one. We're baldest move there. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, support us at support.baldmove.com. It's not just good feelings. You don't just get the good feelings of, of keeping us podcasting, but you get uh, ad-free feeds, uh, bonus episodes of podcast, uh, off the clock where we talk about a bunch of TV and movies that we're not talking about on our main podcast, Lunch with Jim and Aaron, tons of extra bonus features. Check that out at support.baldmove.com. That's going to do it this week for us here at Foundation and Podcast. Until next week, I'm your host, Aaron. And I'm Jim. Respect and enjoy the podcast.